Welcome to Today at Wayne, a podcast that engages and informs the Wayne State University campus community. With news, announcements, information, and current events discussions relevant to the university's goals and mission, Today at Wayne serves as the perfect forum for our campus to begin a conversation or keep one going. Thanks for joining us. Hello, I'm Wayne State University President M. Roy Wilson. I usually don't host Today at Wayne podcasts, but I just could not pass up the opportunity to talk to a very special guest today. So I've got the pleasure of guest hosting today. Our guest is Dr. Larry Brilliant, a 1969 graduate of the Wayne State University School of Medicine, who has gone on to live one of the most interesting and impactful lives you could ever dream of. He's a Detroit native, and he's made a name for himself as an epidemiologist, public health and infectious disease expert, a technologist, philanthropist, and author. He has many, many achievements. I'm just gonna go through a few. Perhaps the most important aspect of his career is as a key member of the successful WHO smallpox eradication program for Southeast Asia, as well as the WHO polio eradication program. For this work, he uh, has written a book, which uh, I will recommend to everyone called Sometimes Brilliant. It's a memoir about working to eradicate smallpox, and it's a guide to managing vaccination programs entitled The Management of Smallpox Eradication. Something else that he's done in his career is, is very dear to my heart as an ophthalmologist who has practiced in global health. He's also the co-founder and serves as chairman of the SIVA Foundation, which is an international nonprofit known for preventing and treating blindness and other visual impairments. SIVA's projects have given back sight to more than 5 million blind people in two dozen countries. I've got so many other things here that I could talk about. Let me just skip to just one other uh, work-related um, thing that he does. And that is he serves as CEO of Pan Defense Advisory, which was founded in 2020 in response to the pandemic. But Pan Defense the, uh, was founded many years ago, I think 16 years ago. And Pan Defense Advisory is a, a successor to Pan Defense. It's an interdisciplinary network of experts that help organizations respond to pandemics. Like I said, I'm going to skip most of the other stuff. Otherwise, we'll be here uh, most of the, um, uh, a lot of time. But I do want to just go ahead and start with the uh, pandemic. I think that's as good a place to start as any. Uh, Larry, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And let me ask you the question, how would you describe where we're at currently with the COVID pandemic? Roy, it's so nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I, I think all of us would agree that uh, the pandemic has been a series of crossroads. Every time we come to one thus far, it seems like just as we feel like we're in the clear, um, there's a new variant, there's another country that's infected, um, there's something we haven't thought of, we get vaccine resistance, mask resistance, becomes heavily politicized. Um, we've had these obstacles crop up uh, at every time. And we're at a, another kind of a crossroads. Um, we are the lowest vaccinated of the G7 countries. And by a long measure, if, if you compare us to Japan, which you know, six months ago had done almost no vaccinating is now well over 75%. Uh, well, we're in the 60s. Um, and, and that's generous because we're not really counting everybody who could be vaccinated, like young children, when we say that. Uh, it means that there's somewhere between 50 and 100 million Americans who are uh, vulnerable, who are uh, susceptible to the disease right now. And we're going into the winter cadence. And this cadence that begins with the Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, each one of these events are accelerants. And they're especially accelerants 
if unvaccinated people and vaccinated people are together, if people are not wearing masks, and if booster shots are not available. There's only really four states so far who have made boosters available to everyone. I know that the FDA is going to change that uh, in the next couple of weeks. I think it's unrealistic to think that we won't have a, uh, a bump or a bump at because it has to be smaller than last year, God help us. Um, and it should be smaller mathematically because there will be fewer people who are susceptible. But there'll be counties, Roy, that will have outbreaks in the next few months that will look like uh, Germany, which is on fire. Uh, and while we say that Germany has a bad outbreak and they're, they're bracing themselves for 100,000 deaths, Europe's bracing itself for 500,000 deaths between now and February. These are numbers that are, un you know, but we will have counties in the United States like that. We won't have states, I don't think. And we certainly as a country, um, we need not have that if, if we, if people get vaccinated, if they observe masking, if they take care of themselves at the holidays to get testing, to be sure that they're not uh, gonna either yeah. bring in the disease or spread it. But we're, we're at a crossroads again. Yeah, scary numbers. You know, you created, as I've already mentioned, Hand Defense 16 years ago, and now successor Hand Defense Advisory. You know, that seems awfully prescient to me, uh, Larry. You knew there was a pandemic like the one uh, we're currently experiencing, that it was going to be inevitable, didn't you? Well, I, you know, after we eradicated smallpox, I got this TED Prize, and I was asked to think about uh, what would be the best use of the money that they were giving me and, uh, and the TED community. And that led me to talk to epidemiologists because might as well be in epidemiology because that's my field. And the more I talked, the more I, I sensed there was this apprehension. Uh, when I started Pan Defense, we were dealing with H5N1. Uh, that is a, um, an influenza strain that has a case fatality rate of 60%. And we were worried as a world that it would go from just being lethal to being more transmissible because some of the other flus, it is a kind of highly pathogenic bird flu. Uh, some of the other bird flus became very, very transmissible. And that's why I called the first meeting of Pan Defense is to brought experts and, uh, from the tech community, the investment community and, and epidemiology to this meeting, the first Pan Defense meeting. And we did surveys, we had, uh, um, uh, Brooke Fischoff, who was the chairman of risk communications at Carnegie Mellon. And we, we queried hundreds of epidemiologists, what are you worried about? And the consensus was they all worried about a pandemic, but they'd never articulated it. And so I started working on it. That helped lead to my becoming a vice president of Google. They gave me some money. I started working more on it. Um, if you saw the movie Contagion, that's sort of a derivative of that meeting. Um, and uh, I became the science advisor for contagion. So there's a lot of things going on at that time as we all began to realize that a pandemic might happen. And, uh, and then in a surprise, uh, uh, President Bush asked me to chair a uh, presidential committee um, on, on biosurveillance. And that got me even more involved uh, as we had to go through all the three letter, letter agencies and yeah. all the other agencies. So, so the, the apprehension of a pandemic has been there, but it's been in pockets. I think it was in bringing it all together that um, I became, you know, sort of one, one of the many people uh, who have warned about this. Um, I, I, I don't want you to think that I was the only Cassandra. There have been a lot of people who've been warning about this for a long time. And you have to ask yourself, did it really do any good? Um, have we heeded any of those warnings? Not from me, but from the whole community. Um, I think that uh, I think the Bush presidency, they, they set up a lot of pand pandemic defense entities. I think that Obama improved them and created what we had asked for in our committee report, which is a, a position at the National Security Council of somebody working on pandemics. And then Trump just tore, that, tore all that up, uh, removed the position, defunded the work on pandemics. We were so unprepared. Um, whereas a year before the Trump administration, we were declared the most prepared nation in the world. I think a year after we were the least. It's really a tragic story. Yeah. You know, you've described this as a 
wherever a virus, which makes me think that you believe that we'll never get back to pre-2019 um, uh, and, and pre-2019. Uh, so what do you think the new normal is going to look like? Well, it is a forever virus. Um, it will be around for a long time. Uh, it, we can't eradicate it because it's in 12 animal species already. Um, and we can't reach herd immunity because the Delta variant is so transmissible that we would have to v vaccinate or have people immune from getting the disease. We'd have to reach 90 plus percent of the population. We're stuck at 65. Um, so it will be in the US uh, ping ponging back and forth from state to state and globally, um, most Americans have no idea what it takes to make a global vaccination program all over the world. Uh, WHO has uh, categorized 2 billion people as being remote and rural. And by definition, they mean that those are people who um, can't reach a health center. 1 billion who are the poorest and the most vulnerable in the world can't be reached by a health center coming to them. So you're dealing with a huge number of people who will not be vaccinated this year or next year or the year after or the year after that. So of course the virus will always go where there are people who are susceptible. And that means that it will continue to uh, have hot epidemics that spill off variants uh, in faraway places, but also in some remote parts of the United States. Uh, that's the problem. Um, and, but it's also the opportunity. There has never been in my time, in my lifetime, Roy, a moment where I could say to someone, the most selfish effing thing that you could do for yourself is also the most selfless thing. And as a country, the most selfish effing thing that we could do for ourselves is to be selfless and to provide vaccine for the poorest and the most remote 2 billion people. Now we're not doing it. The Biden administration is doing a lot more, but these companies, Moderna in specific, I've, I've been arguing with some of their close people there and they, they just have not been willing to help other factories manufacture mRNA vaccines. I think Pfizer's loosening up a little bit and both of them are under tremendous pressure. But we yep. need these vaccines being manufactured closer to where people live to shorten the supply chain. And we need that. We actually need a different kind of vaccine too, Roy. We need one that doesn't require a immunization, doesn't require a cold chain. Can you imagine these health workers trotting five miles, carrying all of this stuff that they can't get to by road and um, maybe they're on a motorcycle? We need to have a vaccine that gives nasal immunity mucosal immunity. The reason that these vaccines are having waning immunity is because they don't give immunity in the nasopharynx where the virus first comes. So we need a different kind of vaccine that gives you more rapid immunity. It takes 14 days to become immune with Pfizer or Moderna. We need rapid immunity. We need post-exposure prophylaxis, mucosal immunity. We need a nasal spray or a drop. And we need it not to need a cold chain and easily manufactured. And we can do those things. And there are about half a dozen vaccines that have those properties in trials right now. So I'm optimistic about that. I'm also really optimistic about the two antivirals from Merck and Pfizer. We might find ourselves really fortunate. And both countries, both companies in this case, are making agreements. Uh, I, think, uh, I think Pfizer just announced that they have agreements with 97 countries. Uh, to make the generic equivalent. So we might get really lucky, but we got to get lucky fast. And right. we've got to be more serious about this. And this nonsense about the kind of anti-vax, anti-mask, COVID is a hoax. There really weren't three quarters of a million deaths. Um, we in public health have got to look at that and look at it as an emergency. It's an emergency when so many people in the United States and in Germany, that's why they're having a, an epidemic there. Why so many people don't take this seriously. This is a pandemic. It's not going to go away. We wanna push it so that it, 
becomes quiet. We know how to do that, but we can't pretend that it doesn't exist and we can't pretend that it's not serious. Staying on the theme of the unvaccinated for a moment, you discussed the, you know, one of the issues globally, not all areas have access to the uh, vaccine, but, you know, there are places like Germany and the United States where access is really not the issue. You just have people who don't want to take it. Um, 70 million in, in, in Americans, for example, adult Americans who um, have not yet been vaccinated. Is it possible, you think, to convince them to get vaccinated or are we going to have to have one of these you know, newer modes of delivery or something else like we were discussing? I think we're making incremental progress towards better numbers, but it's nothing close to what we need. Only 15% of Americans who are eligible for a booster have availed of it. Yeah. And the booster is a huge difference between two doses of mRNA. The booster gives you close to sterilizing immunity. It, it pre prevents you from getting the disease or giving it at a much greater rate than having just two doses. So you're not taking the booster only for yourself. You're taking it to prevent it from going to others. But it also protects you from getting it. Uh, I think we've underestimated the effect of long COVID. Uh, a booster dose really protects you from getting the disease and therefore will protect you from getting long COVID. Um, you know, the, the vaccine mandates are a double-edged sword. They do get more people uh, vaccinated if a company or a county uh, requires you to get vaccinated by law or by agreement. Uh, but they do set up a lot of anti-vax sentiment. Um, so those are, I'm in yeah. favor of them. Uh, they have helped. Um, and there's certainly cases where you just can't let vaccinated people bear the brunt of unvaccinated people coming into that that same room or that same event. Um, I'll give you an example. Why do we have vaccine mandates for children for two dozen vaccines? Because we agree as a society that our public schools should be open to anyone. And there are kids who are immunocompromised, who have cancer, are being treated with chemotherapy, who have a a, a parent at home who's immunocompromised, or the child has lupus or some other disease that makes them not able to have an immune system against COVID, uh, or against measles, or against mumps, or against chickenpox, or all these other diseases, DPT. So we have a mandate. You can't come to school unless you're vaccinated. This is the same thing. You can't come into a gathering unless you're vaccinated against COVID. That's why there are these mandates. It, it's not so much to force you to do anything, it's just to prevent you from doing something, which is to get other people sick. So I, I neglected to mention this at the beginning, but you earned your medical degree at Wayne State. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your, your Wayne State training and um, your experiences? What really contributed most to your remarkable career? Any, any, uh, any um, tidbits about your training at Wayne State that um, allowed you to make such a difference in this world? Well, the fact that, 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 uh, that Wayne admitted me was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> since I never graduated from college, <laughs> and I was a philosophy major, and I hadn't taken my pre-med courses. Um, and the fact that they, they were willing to bet on me um, was changed my life. Um, I, uh, there were two of us in my class of 100 who did not, who, uh, who had not been pre-med, who had not taken uh, um, organic chemistry or any of the defining classes before we went into medical school. It turned out both of us were philosophy majors, so we became good friends. Um, why would a philosophy major student be prepared for medical school? And why would that be a, a helpful um, undergraduate course and how how on earth could you ever trust some jerk who never took any science courses <laughs> to really be a good doctor but wayne decided that they wanted to have a balanced class they wanted to have people who thought differently and came from different areas so they they deliberately wanted to have uh, a couple of people at least to try that and um i, I think i wound up with pretty good grades uh the class was they were really happy with me um I was very good at math, uh, but I hadn't really had a lot of the 
advanced pre-med classes that a lot of other people did. And the uh, compassion and the way that uh, the deans, the associate deans and the other students uh, helped me to uh, get, get, get better faster at science and how much I, it turned out that I loved science. And I loved the interface between math and science which is, of course, what epidemiology is. And right. more, more than that, I love the commitment to the public, which is what you know, made me interested in public health. Um, Wayne gave me my uh, junior year to go abroad. So I went to London and I studied at Guy's Hospital. And uh, my, uh, my, my year abroad was on international health. So we bought a Volkswagen camper and we we went to every European country and met people and talked about their healthcare system and how it was different from ours. And then we drove through Russia. This is my medical school uh, uh, roommate uh, and I. We drove through Russia, uh, the Soviet Union then, from Helsinki to Istanbul. And in each place we asked, you know, how do you deal with this disease? What are your hospitals? How could I have had that experience any other place? Wayne allowed me to do that. Um, I'm deeply grateful, and I'll, I'll never forget what Wayne did for me. Well, that was a, a great bet that Wayne um, took, and um, I certainly, we, we've been a beneficiary of that also. Um, you know, you've led such a service-oriented life. You know, what advice would you have for students, not just medical students, but, you know, just even from any discipline about serving their communities or working to make a difference in the world? Well, you know, some of this always sounds corny. Uh, we're such a jaded <laughs> and skeptical um, world. Um, you know, it is better to give than receive. We, we think about that now as being like a dad joke. <laughs> but it's really true. Um, my greatest moments of happiness was in seeing someone else uh, receive the food that the food bank gave, receive sight that, um, that, that a seva uh, ophthalmologist gave. How can you not feel good about that? I, I saw the last case of smallpox in the world because I had worked hard and I wound up in this little, you know, Ola Island in Bangladesh, dirt poor. And the last case of smallpox meant that an unending chain of transmission back to the pharaohs, billions of people who were killed by this disease ended when she coughed when the viruses dropped on the soil and the sun cooked them. I would never have had that experience in corporate America. I would never have had that experience if I stayed in academe. I, a life of service opens up so many doors and it is the best thing you can ever do for your heart. Public health tells you that uh, uh, preventive medicine, working in that field, both on yourself and on your and on your community is the healthiest thing you can do for yourself. I, you know, there's not enough time for me to laud the, uh, the unexpected gifts that you get when you give. Well, I'm, I'm sure our students would take that to heart. We have, we have great students. You know, you served as an advisor and you mentioned this already on the, on the pandemic uh, movie Contagion, which I saw, by the way, it was, uh, it was a good movie. And, and so much of what we went through in this pandemic was uh, was depicted in, in Contagion. Um, and, and, and you connected the director of Contagion, Steven Sodenberg, with Wayne State to provide COVID testing for the uh, crew of his uh, new movie, No Sudden Move, which we really appreciate you doing that. Uh, that was uh, also shot in Detroit. Um, are you connected to any other movie, movie projects that you can talk about? I am. Um, a, a quite a few. In fact, uh, one which is coming out uh, this week that <clears throat> Participant has done. I'm, I'm part of the group that works with Participant movies, and you know they, they've made many Oscar movies, including um, uh, uh, Al Gore's movie uh, and so many others, and, they, and, and also Spotlight and many other movies, but they've, they've done one now on the very first cases of COVID in New York City, and that's coming out this week. Um, I work with a, a really sweet guy named uh, Seth McFarlane, who does The Family Guy, and we've worked together on a, a bunch of uh, PSAs using The Family Guy characters to tell people about 
vaccination. Uh, he's also got a TV series called The Orville, a uh, science fiction story. And I've worked with him on that, on the COVID protocols for the last year. But I've also gotten into the plot and uh, enjoy it a lot. Um, my colleague and I uh, made the protocols for Hollywood, uh, for the Directors Guild, the Producers Guild. Um, uh, and, and that has put us even more in touch with Hollywood. And I think they're turning my book into a, a TV series. So I'll continue to have a relationship with Hollywood. Um, you know, the, the idea for doing uh, Contagion as a fictional movie was not mine. I, I wanted to do it as a documentary. And uh, the folks uh, at Participant and Warner Brothers convinced me that nobody watches documentaries in the quantity that they do a fictional movie. They were right, I was wrong. Um, but we tried to make it as accurate scientifically as possible. So that while it might have been fiction in the script, it was not fiction in the way the science was um, descriptive. And we also wanted to make it as an homage to the people at CDC, WHO, those on the front line who risk their life every day dealing with pandemics. And I'm, I'm glad that it came out the way that it did. Great, great movie. Hey, uh, last question, you know, as we head into Thanksgiving and given the, uh, the tone of this conversation about global issues, in the many uh, meaningful holidays around the world, uh, during, particularly during this time of the year, is there a message of hope and gratitude that you can share with people? Oh, there is. Uh, throughout history, pandemics bring out the best and the worst. Throughout history, nations and empires rise and fall because of enduring the pandemic, whether it's the Black Plague, the 1918 pandemic that coexisted with World War I or now. Um, I think the Trump administration uh, ended because of the way that the pandemic was handled under their watch. And I think it's always the case that you see the best and the worst. The best, the first responders. I still remember when they sang from uh, the, the balconies in, in Italy to celebrate the first responders. In my community here in Marin County, for some reason we decided to howl. I don't know why, but we howled to thank the first responders. Um, I still remember the phone calls that I got from China and from Italy when uh, doctors who didn't quite understand the disease that they were facing died. Uh, the frontline workers died, the patients died, and they were just brokenhearted. Uh, and to this day, you'll see anytime you go into a hospital, just turn around to the first nurse's aide or you know, operator or uh, phlebotomist, intern, resident, just turn to any of them at random and say, thank you. Because we would not have had as few deaths as we had. That sounds terrible. We've had three quarters of a million Americans die. More than died in the 1918 pandemic. More than died in all the wars in the United States has fought ever. Uh, more than all the Americans who died in all the wars in the 20th century. It's a huge number, a quarter of a million. It's going to cause a notch in our life expectancy curve that we haven't had uh, since 1920. So just thank the people who have given their life, risked their time, their, their, everything to make you safe. That's the question. Can you, can, you, can you think about that? Everyone listening to this, can you think about all the people who had to run the supply chains, the essential workers, the first responders, the healthcare workers. You and I would not have been as safe as we were and got through it thus far if it hadn't been for them. Yeah. Well, Larry, this has been, this has been terrific. Um, we thank you for taking the time to do this. You've had um, just an incredible career and I'm sure that those who would be listening to this podcast will be inspired by all the things that you've done. Please um, uh, send my regards to your lovely wife, Irja, and um, uh, take care. Really, thank you very, very much. Roy, thank you so much. Remember, my wife is from Detroit. We met yep. when she was 15 and I was 16 in high school. And, uh, you know, we're proof that, uh, you know, hippie relationships do, in fact, last and endure. Uh, and as does my love for Detroit and for Wayne, that also endures. Thank you very much, Larry.
Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for listening to Today at Wayne. We'd love to hear from you, our campus community, about other podcast ideas and topics. What compelling things are you doing to spread the good word about living, learning, working, and playing like a warrior? Let us know by visiting todayatwayne.edu.